Mexican independence is on the way. This is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes, and I'm Robert Martinez, State Historian of New Mexico. 16 de septiembre, 1821. The 16th of September, 1821. That's when New Mexico stopped being a colony of Spain and of New Spain to the south and became Mexican, became part of the new nation of Mexico. This year, 2021, on the 16th of September, we will celebrate 200 years since that momentous event. It's significant because it really was a turning point, not just in Mexican history, but New Mexico history. Um, it was our first taste of independence. We were no longer part of a empire that was ruled by absolute monarchy. And yet, we still lived in the shadows and vestiges of that system. We were integrated completely into the Mexican government. Our culture fit in nicely with all the other different regions of Mexico. There are documents that show that we were part of that system. We sent representatives to uh, different parts of the South, Mexico City, Chihuahua, uh, to represent New Mexico in the federal Mexican government. Political officials went, ricos, not so ricos, priests, Padre Martinez, Padre Rada. They were also integrated into that political system. So it's quite amazing to see how we transitioned quite easily from being a provincia and a reino, a province and kingdom, into being a territory of Mexico. Now, that system was kind of complicated. Um, you had a uh, uh, jefe político and a jefe militar, a political governor and a military governor. It was a dual system uh, that would often be uh, occupied by uh, one person who would then move into the other position or vice versa. And it was quite uh, amazing how this uh, method of rule would eventually uh, guide New Mexico from being a Spanish holding, a Spanish territory, uh, into being a Mexican territory. The first 15 years, oh, from about 1821 to about 1836, 1837, New Mexico was ruled in a similar way as it was under Spain. Uh, you had uh, the, the politics remained Similar, not the same, uh, but they were uh, uh, still vestiges of the Spanish system. Um, the society was changed radically in that uh, the people were now Mexican citizens. The Pueblo people were Mexican citizens. The Nuevo Mexicanos were uh, Mexican citizens. Everyone was. There was no more casta system. There was no slavery. Uh, 1829, Mexico got rid of slavery quietly. Um, I'm not going to say everyone was for it, but um, there was no civil war to get rid of slavery in Mexico. It just happened. So this is what's going on here. And then things, as we know, will radically shift with uh, the uh, uh, taxes and uh, emphasis on local federal power in Mexico City in 1837. Um, this leads to uh, seismic shifts uh, politically, uh, demographically, and even um, um, economically in New Mexico and in places like Texas and California, where there'll be a revolution in Texas and a movement towards independence because of these events. Um, New Mexico has its own uh, issues with the Mexican government. Um, we were integrated and part of it, and we participated, and yet we we're used to doing things on our own. Uh, as a colony, we had to fend for ourselves for the most part. And then as a territory, we also still had those habits of uh, deciding things on our own. The old Spanish notion of obedezco, pero no cumplo. I obey, but I will not comply. That kind of was the mentality of the New Mexicans. So uh, we could be somewhat difficult to govern. So things start to shift around 1837 
and you start to see uh, these um, political uh, uh, earthquakes in New Mexico. We had 17 uh, Mexican governors uh, between 1821 and 1846. Uh, some of them were New Mexicans and so, some of them were uh, Mexicanos, usually military men appointed from Mexico City. Before that, um, we had about 63 Spanish governors, again, appointed uh, from Mexico City. So uh, we still were not uh, getting this uh, taste of uh, democracy and freedom uh, that uh, we saw happening in the United States back east starting in 1776. But nonetheless, uh, New Mexico is uh, participating in Mexican government, a Mexican society, and culture. Our culture had been evolving since the 1600s and the 1700s, becoming a blend and an amalgam of Iberian, Spanish, and Portuguese, but blended heavily with Mexican Indian influences. And then again, with local Pueblo cultures, and then later in the 1700s and 1800s, uh, Comanche, Apache, Navajo, Ute, Kiowa, Henisaro Indian cultural elements. So this affects us. This affects um, our uh, racial background. It affects our language, how we speak Spanish. Um, you have to wonder what the Spanish sounded like uh, in the early to mid-1800s compared to how it sounded in the mid-1600s or mid-1700s. There's this idea that uh, the Spanish in New Mexico was frozen in time, but that's not true. It was continually changing and evolving depending on all the different peoples that came into contact with it and spoke it. So by the mid-1800s, um, we have reports that uh, the New Mexicans speak a very unique form of Spanish, and it's because our pronunciation is part Spanish, part Mexican, and part New Mexican. So we're definitely a unique cultural, uh, expressive society by the early to mid-1800s. Um, we have artistic expressions uh, like our santo tradition. Santo tradition is religious carvings and paintings uh, that come out of the 1700s. In the 1700s, a lot of the art in our churches were brought up from Mexico City along the Camino Real. They were usually uh, Baroque-style paintings with uh, heavy influences from the Renaissance with uh, uh, three-dimensional and two-dimensional imagery, um, a vanishing point, uh, interesting backgrounds and details. And we get some of that with the paintings uh, that certain priests uh, execute in New Mexico or artists like Bernardo Mira y Pacheco. But by the 1800s, New Mexico's art tradition really falls back and relies heavily on Pueblo art expressions. And that's why our Santero tradition uh, continues to this day with a very, um, I would say it's a medieval look, but it looks kind of like medieval Spanish art, but it's also Puebloan in its uh, presentation, colors, materials used, uh, uh, resources uh, for uh, paint colors and wood, local resources. So by the mid-1800s, it's a very New Mexican thing, and um, it gets criticized by outsiders, whether they're uh, Spanish outsiders, Mexican outsiders, or American outsiders. Uh, they look down on and criticize our hide paintings, our carvings, our music expressions, our way of dressing, but it's definitely become Nuevo Mexicano by, say, 1850. And the Americans call it, correctly, Mexican. They say we speak Mexican language and uh, our foods are uh, foreign to them and we are foreign to them. They look down on us as mixed blood Mexican people. They call us savage Indians. But um, nonetheless, we uh, persevere and live our lives and prepare to be uh, made citizens of the United States by 1850. So I just wanted to give this overview of what kind of culture 
uh, the Americans were encountering when they come along the Santa Fe Trail starting in 1821 during our Mexican period and then into the territorial American period. It's a beautiful, amazing uh, culture with roots in Mexico, extending to Spain, Portugal, France, North Africa, um, Southern Africa. There's all kinds of elements here. There's Jewish and Muslim also represented. So keep this in mind, and I'm going to start presenting our history in New Mexico as a U.S. territory, looking at the period between 1850 and and 1912. See you later. Goodbye. Adios.